Good morning and welcome to uh, today's <coughs> seminar. It's a seminar arranged by uh, the Institute of Security and Development Policy, the uh, Japan Center. <coughs> <coughs> so sorry. <coughs> the Japan Center at the ISDP. And we are very happy to uh, welcome uh, Professors uh, Kubota, uh, Kurata and Professor uh, Kubota from the National Defense Agency in Japan. And also Helen Tong, uh, a lawyer from uh, the UK who is here at, or should I present you as from the UK or Australia? Please. Both. <laughs> uh, who is now uh, at the moment a guest researcher at the ISDP. Uh, today's topic uh, will be, uh, actually today's topics, there will be several topics. Uh, there are so many issues that surround Japan today. And uh, we have the Korean Peninsula, we have the East China Sea, we have the multilateralism, question of multilateralism and international law, and of course we have the South China Sea issue. So we'll try to weave this all together by our excellent three um, uh, presentators. And we'll start <coughs> by asking uh, Professor Kubota to talk about uh, Japan and multilateral global efforts for peace. After that, we'll move on to Japan and a possible uh, contingency on the Korean Peninsula. I think this is a subject that will interest everybody. And then we'll round up with, uh, with uh, Dr. Tong, who will, will talk about the South China Sea and the international, international law and the legal aspects of uh, of, of those questions that, that arise from that. I hope that you will ask a lot of questions and, 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 and also come with comments. And I hope that we have plenty of time, so I hope that uh, we will have a, a lively uh, seminar. Again, most welcome, and I'd like to give the word to Professor uh, Kubota. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a congratulations for the establishment of Japan Center, right? Uh, and it's very honor for me or us to make our presentation here, such a memorial uh, seminar here. Uh, my name is Norito Kubota. Uh, I'm te usually teaching the theoretical aspect of quantitative aspect of international relations and at the National Defense Academy. Uh, and uh, as uh, yes, I and I have been a uh, Visiting a fellow, visiting researcher at the ISDP, it was seven years ago. I think it was uh, time passed uh, so long. And uh, today, uh, I'd like to make a short, in, a very introductory uh, presentation of Japanese uh, contribution to uh, multinational, uh, multilateral global efforts for peace, uh, which means that limited to the contribution to uh, peacekeeping operation by the self-defense force. But although it has a lot of uh, contributors in Jap Japan, but uh, I would like to concentrate on the self-defense uh, force. So I'm going to present uh, the basic fact of Japan's, uh, Japanese multilateral uh, security policies in chron chronological way, and uh, go I'm going to add a short uh, list of my comments uh, at the end of the presentation. So, uh, during the Cold War, uh, so Japan has been, a, had to say, so to speak, a passive uh, uh, toward the global and regional military effort uh, due to the several reasons listed. Here, of course, uh, the anti-militarism is pervasive in, uh, after the, uh, the World War II, and of course the destruction of economic infrastructure by, the, by that war, or uh, the suspicion by neighboring countries uh, on Japanese uh, active uh, role or active participation in such, uh, in such issue area. And also, uh, the, United, the United States uh, uh, contributed, the, uh, uh, security, uh, provided the security uh, for, uh, for Japan. So uh, the Japan could not and um, don't have the, uh, the, act, uh, the uh, very incentive toward that ki such kind of uh, effort. Uh, even after the economic recovery in 1960s or the 70s, uh, that will not change the, uh, drastically uh, the security policy. 
Of course, the, there are several areas uh, the Jap uh, Japan has been uh, very good at, uh, uh, like the provision of ODA or uh, the effort toward the nuclear disarmament or uh, the non proliferation and uh, establishing or uh, contributing to multi layered uh, security cooperation listed here. Uh, but the, uh, the contribution of the military is rather very diffi difficult in, uh, under uh, the situation which I explained uh, before. The Gulf War uh, in uh, Gulf crisis in 1990 90, and the Gulf War in 1991 was uh, uh, a big shock to the Japanese Gulf, uh, Japan since there were uh, no legal framework to, uh, which enabled Japan to contribute beyond its border. And uh, it was criticized, it's, uh, so to speak, checkbook diplomacy, and uh, uh, despite of its huge financial contribution to the multinational force to save Kuwait. Uh, so that experience uh, activated, uh, activated the debate over how to contribute uh, uh, to the global peace, uh, and it ended as a passing of the uh, law, uh, International Peace Cooperation Law, in 1992. Uh, uh, which enabled the JSDF Japan Self Defense Force to uh, participate in UN peacekeeping operation under the five conditions. So five conditions I just say is uh, listed here. Uh, it's uh, the, these conditions. Uh, yeah, you can see that it's very let's say reflect the rather traditional types of peacekeeping operation than, rather than uh, uh, the coming new types of uh, uh, of the UN mission which sometimes have chapter seven type operation or sometimes say the, the enforcement mission or peace support operations. So it actually, the, the condition is rather conservative one and it's traditional types of operation. But uh, despite of this uh, strict condition, uh, the Japanese peacekeepers, which is not limited to uh, self-defense force, uh, 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 for service personnel uh, joined in operation all over, all, over the, all over the world listed on, on this map during 25 years. Uh, this map is created, uh, yeah, this map is actually created of the uh, Secretary of, of International uh, Peace Cooperation Headquarters under the cabinet. And uh, this figure shows that how many uh, uniformed personnel uh, was sent to UN uh, mission uh, from Japan. And uh, the comp contribution to uh, mission in Cambodia and East Timor, uh, Haiti, and South Sudan uh, constitute a peak or the flat, flat higher plate uh, of this uh, figure. And of course, I have to add that JSDF uh, dispatched several hundreds of troops uh, to the operations in Iraq. Iraq, which is uh, uh, not, it is outside of a UN mission uh, from 2004 to 2008. And you may know that recently uh, it is announced that uh, the main component of the uh, Japan Self Defense Force will be withdrawn from South Sudan by the end of May. So the, it makes the downsizing of the troop contribution uh, in the near future. And uh, uh, Japanese contribution to uh, the, the UN operation is mainly focused on the engineering or uh, the logistic types of operation like uh, medical or uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, tran transportation. Uh, so it ended uh, to arrange the UN uh, unit manual uh, for engineering in 2015. However, uh, there are little uh, limitations uh, in the field. Uh, in the field. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Japanese peacekeepers have been prevented from participating in collective defense of their colleagues in missions, uh, uh, which is reflects the five, five conditions of the peacekeeping operation. 
And also, there are no legal framework which enables Japan to participate in coalition type operation, in, uh, which are now uh, 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 the mainstream after the 9 11. Uh, of course, the Japan sent the JSDF to participate in, in the operation, uh, operation after the uh, war in Iraq, Iraq but, uh, it, but this special, uh, and, of, and also the in, uh, operation in, in the Indian Ocean. But this, special, uh, but this is through the special uh, uh, measurement law. And uh, these special, uh, special major laws were temporary. Uh, temporary legislation and this temporary temporality makes the Japanese commitment less stable. So therefore, the permanent uh, legislation was called for uh, called for for a really long long time. So present uh, administration, Abe administration, uh, which was started in 2012, uh, made several moves in security policies. Uh, this is. This list, is, this list is not exclusive, uh, exhaustive one, but uh, uh, I picked up the several uh, important ones on this slide. And the two of them, uh, which I put as a star on the right hand side, uh, have the, the most created one to this uh, topic I'm now presenting. So one of them, uh, the proactive contribution for peace. Uh, the principle uh, of the pr uh, proactive contribution for peace was uh, adopted as the basic principle of the, for Japan's national security strategy. And it is based on the recognition uh, that uh, there are the several, uh, severe security environments surrounding Japan, uh, like the WMD uh, or Baltic missile and uh, cyber attacks and so on. It shows the importance of the active contribution uh, to regional and global stability, uh, stability and security incorporated with the international uh, society. So following the, uh, that, uh, under these uh, principles, uh, the cabinet's decision uh, to reinterpret the Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution to allow the use of military power to be widened. Uh, after the intensive discussion uh, in the diary, uh, during, uh, during, actually during which the, there are public opposition, opposition sometimes uh, in surrounding the parliament building, but uh, the legislation was approved by the diet on the September 19, 2015, and it came to, into effect uh, the last March uh, 2016. Uh, what was enabled by that uh, legislation? Uh, the, I would like to uh, say uh, bit, some examples. Uh, it enab for instance, uh, enable, it enabled uh, uh, Japan to contribute to non-UN mission uh, without special major law. Although uh, five conditions I just I mentioned were uh, still to be met. And it also uh, added the task of protection of civi civilian or protection of population, in, uh, local population, or protection of uh, the colleagues uh, uh, or in UN mission or other mission. So through this presentation, uh, I have shown uh, uh, a slow but gradual, gradual expansion of Japan's contribution to our global uh, effort for military effort for peace. Of course, it's true uh, that there are still a strong limitation uh, in legal frameworks for their contribution. Uh, furthermore, the public uh, opinion is not necessarily uh, enthusiastic about uh, the such contributions. But uh, Japan, I can say that uh, in the uh, is in the in the course of learning of. Uh, multilateral military cooperation uh, right now. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we have um, plenty of time, so I think uh, if anyone has any question at this moment, we can take one or two questions now, but otherwise we will we have uh, plenty of time after the presentations. But if there's anyone who has a comment or a question at this moment, please. 
If not, I will leave the word to Professor uh, Kurata, who will talk about Japan and a possible contingency on the Korean Peninsula. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kurata, and I'm professor at the uh, National Defense Academy uh, in charge of the Korean Affairs and Security of Japanese uh, Japan, Japan Academy. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much for the arranging such a kind of, such a wonderful uh, forum today. And on behalf of the delegation, just because of two of us, I uh, just thank you very much for the staff and the uh, uh, professors of Japan Center of the UN, uh, IPP. And my presentation is the uh, kickoff presentation uh, by shedding a light to the uh, uh, security situation in the Korean Peninsula, the activity of the uh, it divided to the Secretary General of Japan. And my short presentation consists of the following contents. The first, I assess the, the North Korea's uh, nuclear posture. It is referred to on the agenda in the US uh, North Korea's bilateral relations. However, I believe that it has uh, local and regional uh, implications to Japan. And next, I will review the Japan's efforts uh, to deter North Korean aggression and to arrange the effects management of the entire North East Asia. In, in spite of the Japan's consistent constraints on, on the ex exercise of the right to cooperative self defense. I will touch upon the Japan's effort to in alliance in the alliance with the United States, uh, reviewing the uh, updating process of Japan and US. A guideline for the defense cooperation. As you know, the original uh, guidelines were released in 1974, 78. Uh, Japan jointly with the United States and updated the uh, document uh, to deal with the security challenge. I will review the updated guidelines back in the 1990s. I also reviewed Japan's the uh, that uh, legislation uh, called for the uh, act of the terrorist uh, situation surrounding the Japan at the time. Uh, it is also followed by the recent development uh, in the same sub perspective. I will review the uh, re updated uh, guideline as well as the Japan's uh, peace and security legislation in a couple of years. Now, first, uh, uh, let me go. Uh, 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 first, to, uh, to the assessment of North Korea's current uh, nuclear posture. Uh, North Korea's uh, current uh, nuclear uh, posture is, in a sense, the common to the uh, other nuclear uh, developing states, such as uh, China and India, uh, to put the nuclear posture. They are often larger than the minimum uh, deterrence. Uh, they are inferior to the uh, adversary in terms of the missiles and nuclear weapons, and as well as the uh, compression forces. Under the minimum tolerance, uh, they show the decision uh, not to intend to win the war um, by declaring the uh, no first use of nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapons are used only for a second uh, strike, strike in retaliation uh, for the nuclear first strike by the adversary. Under the concept of the minimum deterrence, second strike capability uh, to threaten the internal literary, literary damage to the adversary is regarded as much uh, is enough to deter uh, the first strike. So the second strike uh, is basically counter body target uh, rather than the counter forces uh, targeting. North Korea is also uh, declared no first use of nuclear weapons when they conducted the first uh, nuclear test in October 2006. They are supposed to build the nuclear capability uh, for the second, uh, second strike. In this context, it is worth it to note that uh, uh, North Korea demonstrated a remarkable progress in second strike capability in the, uh, in the uh, uh, former part of last year. The second, the second uh, strike capability requires the destruction, assured destruction, and survivability and readiness. 
talking about the assured deter alteration and destruction, it means that not only the range of the missile to reach to the person, the person's soil, but also the warhead were equipped with the uh, anti-heat, anti-pressure uh, nose cone uh, when they entered into the, to the uh, atmosphere. North Korea actually conducted the, uh, that experiment in the laboratory in March last year and tested in the realm of the uh, nature in June last year. And as for the survivability, a second strike capability are survived even after they are uh, attacked under the first attack by the adversary. To secure the survivability, SRBM, a survey once against a missile system, are supposed to be the best. In May and August last year, North Korea succeeded to uh, in a test fire by uh, SLPN uh, from the sea. Uh, survivability is uh, of North Korea's the second strike capability are increased in addition to the existing mobile uh, transportable launchers on the ground. Uh, regardless, uh, regarding the red, uh, redness, I mean the immediate response after the first strike from the Brazil. A wicked fail is easy uh, to develop, but it needs a lot of time to drill into missile before launching. Compared with a wicked missile, a solid missile is better uh, for the immediate response for the fast strike. In March last year, after one year ago, North Korea conducted a grand uh, test of the higher power solid material rocket engine. All these aspects of North Korea's uh, nuclear and missile uh, development <coughs> make the uh, Korean peace situation unstable. And once North Korea perceived that they, are, they can return the U.S. and the U.S. military intervention to the Korean Peninsula, North Korea can conduct the military uh, adventurism to the South Korea. The threats of the North Korea's uh, military propagation are, I think, lowered recently. Actually, looking back to the uh, 2010, North Korea conducted the uh, torpedo attack to the South Korean corporate Tongan Sea in March uh, of that year, and conducted sharing on the Yongpyong Island, uh, the island on the, uh, the LC, in November that year. And part of the war in 2015, two years ago, uh, North Korea's uh, bomber, uh, Yong Chong, uh, in the uh, inland of the Korean Peninsula, in the vicinity of the market line. Clearly, uh, North Korea's uh, escalated provocation to South Korea due to its developed nuclear and missile capability. So, the strategic instability inst uh, enhanced the instability in the regional and local level. Stability, instability, paradox. Uh, still by uh, on the work on, on uh, at work on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, next week, uh, next week. Uh, mm, however, however, uh, the, uh, concurrently, North Korea's rhetoric as well as hardware uh, missile development is more than more than the minimum deterrence. As well as the earlier, the, uh, the minimum deterrence is the question of the verbal commitment to the North, North first use of nuclear weapons. But North Korea uh, 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 did it in, uh, in October 2006. But while advancing the nuclear and missile capability, North Korea started to refer to the possible first nuclear strike since 2013. They said the target, its target is the United States mainland and U.S. based in the Asia Pacific. With the escalated post uh, rhetoric, North Korea seems to have developed the military equipment uh, to be used to attack U.S. military forces. And this is also what I said before, uh, but in minimum terms, is nuclear forces are only for the nuclear uh, uh, the second strike for the president. And these nuclear forces are counter value targeting the city or the industry of the president. 
A counter force capability is to wage the nuclear war and not yield to the militarist posture. Intermediate ballistic missile uh, called Mustang that North Korea tested last year is uh, clearly uh, to target the other civil air base uh, in Guam. Moreover, scattered extended range of the North Korea uh, launched several weeks ago uh, threatened the U.S. base in Japan. In case the war outbreaks on the Korean Peninsula, South Korea's armed forces as well as the U.S. forces in Korea have to fight. But their forces are ground forces centered. Actually, U.S. base in Korea don't have the naval and marine forces for combat action. They are only for the supporting units for the Navy and, and Marine Corps. So the armed attack is occurring in Korean Peninsula. U.S. forces in Japan is crucially important uh, for the dispatch in the Navy and Marine. In addition, it is it's not only in Europe. The legacy of the Korean War in the 1950s is still remain in Japan. I mean, U.S. command was set, set up in Japan in the Korean War, and still now, the U.S. bases in Japan, six U.S. bases in Japan, are designated as U.N. bases. So the uh, uh, bases are automatically used for the combat action for the Korean Pen possible Korean Pen uh, contingency. In that situation, Japan's maritime self-defense forces, assistance to the development of U.S. forces, are very crucial. Moreover, as long as the long danger of the uh, North Korea's bus missile extended to U.S. base in Japan, and even more, uh, information sharing among Japan, U.S., and South Korea is expected for the uh, third out of missile uh, uh, defense. Having said that, let me uh, <coughs> review the Japan Airport in Japan US alliance as well as the domestic resolution in the past. As I said in the last days, uh, Japan and US jointly released the guideline for the defense cooperation in first in nineteen seventy five. Due to the constitutional constraints by the ban on the execution of the right to uh, right to self uh, collective self defense, that both Japan and North the United States have to stipulate what Japan can do and as well as Japan what Japan cannot do in case of the contingency in Japan and in its vicinity. After the end of the Cold War, the first security challenge came from the Korean Peninsula. I will go into the detail that in 1993 and 94. North Korea has announced its withdrawal from the uh, nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty, and North Korea threatened the uh, South Korea to make the capital Seoul city a zero fire. The instance of the war was about to occur at the time. After all, that tension was diffused uh, due to the agreed framework between the U.S. and South Korea and uh, North Korea. But U.S. Japan and U.S. had to re-examine the guideline of the 1948 uh, and decided to update uh, for the fear that North Korea might turn it again. In the updated guideline, Japan and US introduced the concept of the situation of surrounding area. It is a very situational concept, not the geographical concept. But Japan and US shared the anxiety that the situation in Korea might be destabilized again by the North Korea nuclear missile development and its provocation to the South. And Japan and the US share the need to the role of the Japan self defense forces would be widened to assist the US forces deployment. However, Japan is prohibited to execute the right to the self defense by the constitutional interpretation. Japan's civil defense forces are prohibited to join uh, to the arms conflict, and Japan's Japan civil defense force activity should, uh, should, uh, should not be integrated into uh, the U.S. forces. In such uh, constraints, Japan and the United States uh, invented concept of the rear air support. It's a very strange concept. It was constant to allow the Japan Self-Defense Forces to assist 
the U.S. forces to U.S. forces deployment. But at the same time, the cost was to, how can I say, the demarcate the arms conflict and activity of the self defense forces. The terminology of the area is an insolent or the buffer concept to demarcate armed conflict and activity of the self defense forces. For the updated the, uh, the guideline, Japan is uh, the third act of the situation of the area surrounding Japan. In the same vein of the updated the, uh, guideline, it just by the assistance of self defense forces to the US, US forces to in the surrounding areas of the Japan. But on the other hand, it clearly prohibited uh, and foreign activity of the self defense forces, as seen in slide. First, it banned on the mine sweeping activities. And second, it banned on the fueling US forces for the combat action. The third is a ban on uh, providing the uh, munition and power to the US forces. All these activities are regarded to execute the right to the uh, right to the self defense at that time. <coughs> uh, lastly, let me go to uh, the uh, re update the guideline in recent days. The guideline was updated again very recently uh, by the renewed <coughs> challenge uh, from East Korea and China. Uh, North, Korea is uh, North Korea continued to develop nuclear and missile development. Uh, China also attempted to change the rule of norm in, in, in its past week by force. Uh, China's uh, attempts were clearly seen in the South China Sea in recent years <coughs> from the Chinese perspective. There will be some uh, repercussions from the next speaker. Against this backdrop, Prime Minister Abe announced a reinterpretation <coughs> from the Constitution that prohibits the use of the right to the self defense process, that's a self defense. He said Japan's constitution is still prohibited the use of excuse of the right, right to the self defense force, that's called the defense. However, Prime Minister Abe strained that more of self defense forces have to be widened to meet the security challenge. Under the French constitution, his government decided to use the right to craft to self defense quite a limited amount. That was the best that his government can do under the current constitution. Arms remarks paved the way, paved the way for the updating the guideline and Japan's uh, peace and security legislation in 2015. Regarding the US guideline, uh, Japan and the United States introduced the real support for the self defense forces activity for the US forces. As you know, it drops it dropped the area from the real area support in the previous health guideline. In like that, the concept of the area in the previous guideline to demarcate the arms conflict and US uh, Japan self defense for the activities, US guideline permits against the overlapping areas Overlapping of the U.S. as general safety defense forces with the armed conflict to the limited degree. In addition, North Korea's uh, threat, uh, in addition, North Korea uh, threat involves South Korea, uh, Japan, and the United States. It is in a sense that uh, the government promotes triangular defense cooperation, notably in the uh, 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 defense. In so much as the peace and security legislation, legislation was. Um, enacted upon the real update of the guideline, it was very quite natural that the legislation left the ban on self defense force activities in the previous government situated. Three bans on the three uh, the self defense forces activities were allowed in the peace and security legislation. And finally, let me add that the uh, Four cases of the self uh, uh, Japan self defense forces activities are allowed in the peace and security legislation. First, in the defense of U.S. vessel in the high sea. Second, interpretation of the Pacific missile that might be on its way to the United States. A third, a large rear support, uh, rear, rear uh, support overseas. A fourth, the logistic support for the cooperation of other countries participating in a said PKO activity. That's some 
that's exactly what the uh, professor Kubatek worked in a previous presentation. These cases used to be uh, uh, used to be regarded in you know, a execute of the right of the self to the right to copy self certificate in the past. They were not allowed. Let me stress that the, uh, all these activities are the best that the uh, Japan self defense policy can do as long as the present constitution kept intact. Limited as they might be, allowed and the uh, widened the self defense policy activity will contribute to the peace and security in the entire Northeast Asia region, Northeast Asia, including Korean Peninsula. I hope my presentation will help for your understanding of Japan's security situation in terms of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here and thank you very much for ISDP for having me. Uh, today we're, uh, we're talking about multilateralism and international law and do my best to cover the great work um, that Professor Kurata and <laughs> Professor Kubota has already made. I guess what I'd like to do is, uh, before I start, um, and here I'll just outline the topics that I'm going to be talking about, is just two things. I really want to congratulate Stockholm. This year is actually the 100th centenary of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. And as part of their celebrations, uh, celebrating arbitration has been one of them. Arbitration as a tool for peace. Uh, in the past, where wars were fought after World War II, as we know um, from all the trials, in essence, to, uh, arbitration as a tool under international law for all states to consider. So part of my talk will be addressing the South China Sea and the role of international law, specifically law of the sea. And here is an outline of what I will be touching upon. So if I start um, giving you an outline of what the role of international law is, and I recall a statement which is along the lines of, when a student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, as a student and practitioner of international law, I always feel like I'm constantly studying and that teachers constantly appear, which is part of the journey of actually appreciating international law. So on the top right-hand corner, you will see that international law can be used for investments, trade negotiations, TPP, um, TTIP, um, on trips, and at the same time on international law of the sea, which is the topic that I will be focusing on. And specifically, the recent case of the Philippines and China. I mentioned before that arbitration is a tool for states, and that is true, because there are many, many tools, in fact. And one of them, for example, they may not have chosen to go to the court of arbitration. They could have gone to the international courts of justice. And I will explain in a moment what the difference is. But just to give you an outline, um, it took about a two-week trial to hear jurisdiction, it took about a week to hear the merits of the case, and it took about another good year before the decision was made, a bit less than a year. And may I say, one year for a decision is very quick. Um, some of the cases I've dealt with um, up, go up to about 15 years. So I congratulate the tribunal um, for their um, expediency. On the left-hand side, I have simply uh, highlighted some points um, of some laws which um, may be flagged up and are flagged up, actually, in the current... Philippines and China case, of COREX, uh, which is basically collision at sea, um, international seabed authority, particularly in relation to minerals, um, and illegal fishing, fishing being a huge issue, and environmental impact. So what exactly was discussed in this uh, tribunal uh, PCA uh, case? Well, there are three things that I'd like to summarize. Firstly, the status of geographical features, the lawfulness of China's action, and maritime rights and entitlements. So, as many of you know, and have heard of the judgment, I want to dispel anything you've actually read in the media, because the tribunal actually made a decision on the very thing that everyone wanted but didn't. So it's not about territorial dispute, that has to be very clear. It's about maritime. And that's just one of the maps that's there. 
around the Nine Dash Line, which was refuted by the tribunal. But I will highlight some of the issues with the judgment. <clears throat> so, if you don't mind, I'll just lay out some of the basic ideas that were derived from the PCA, and I'm sure there are many, many discussions that you will hear on the tribunal case and its relevance. So, as a state, you have an option to resolve your disputes as you like. And Article 281 provides that option to resolve disputes peacefully. Now, what the UNCLOS doesn't allow for is discussion on military activities that are involved. Um, and historical arguments are actually off limits. In other words, the tribunal wouldn't hear anything on historical limits. And hence, whilst China never participated, that's one of the things that they persistently argued. And one of the tribunal points that they also considered was this idea of states having due regard to the rights and duties of other states. And that very much goes line in line with UNCLOS, which is considering uh, one's own borders and exclusive economic zone. And a very important point, which many of you may want to consider, is Article 2983, which is the idea of consent. So um, under international arbitration or arbitration commercially, usually it's two willing parties coming to the table to negotiate and discuss, like a relationship, like playing football, you need consensus. And interestingly, or unusually, in this particular case, that never happened. So, what does that actually mean? Well, hypothetically, um, one could actually question the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Now, you will find out that a moment ago, I just showed you, the tribunal spent about two weeks justifying why they are entitled to hear the matter, and rightly so, because strictly speaking, if China were to uh, appeal the matter, which they haven't, uh, they may actually have a claim. <coughs> China's non-participation in the case means that the tribunal has a special responsibility. That is not anything new. In any case, if, say, you have a, a, a hearing and the other side doesn't turn up, but the case is ongoing, um, be it they've just started or they've not actually participated, the tribunal needs to exercise fairness in all respects. So what the tribunal did was they enacted something called competence competence. It's an it's a, a arbitral concept, which is the tribunal finds themselves competent to hear the matter, notwithstanding China's non-involvement. And what they said in Article 9, um, in, in UNCLOS, is an absence of a party to defend its case shall not constitute a bar to the proceedings. Interestingly, we have Article 291, and this is a million dollar question, is the party shall be bound by any award to the tribunal issues, which I'll also touch upon in a moment. So now, putting a lawyer's hat on and thinking about the problems of the judgment, there are many. And I mean it from the purely, uh, uh, two respects actually, um, I've already mentioned about participation. Another one is in respect of evidence. So usually when you go to a tribunal, you will argue your case. And I, I use the analogy of playing chess or playing go. How can, and, and choose a side, please, choose black or white. If you choose to play black and the other side plays white, how can you anticipate how the other side is going to play their game? And that is exactly what the Philippines did. They gave examples of how the Chinese would interpret the maps they gave an interpretation of how the Chinese would interpret Chinese. And I have a problem with that purely on a, a legal basis, simply on any case. I've done, dealt with cases between Japanese clients, Chinese clients, Korean clients. And a Chinese to Chinese client can dispute a Chinese document on the very translation. So my question to um, the Philippines is, um, how confident can they be that that is how the Chinese would interpret particular document or present their case. So you can see that there is a slight fallacy in trying to represent yourself and represent the other side. My second issue is in relation to expert reports. And again, this is uh, commonly seen in arbitrations and in court cases where you have A presenting one expert, B presenting another expert, and there's a dispute on the expert. It is not a surprise. And fortunately, in this particular instance, we have an excellent expert report um, I, for my sins, have read the whole judgment, and there's nothing wrong with it. But uh, what we don't have is the Chinese perspective. And I think, um, in, in all fairness, I think it's important to know, even if it's not um, what uh, the Philippines may think 
think of. So if I can just summarise the, the sort of points that are, that are highlighted. Um, what the tribunal determined, um, as I mentioned before, not on territorial rights, the issue of fishing, exploration, harmful fishing uh, methods and installation, but actually at the crux of it, crux of it I would say it's about the rule of law. I was in Tokyo last year at the uh, American Bar Association conference, and I was very privileged to have met some of the counsel for the Philippines um, tribunal case. And they say sometimes, you know, people bring on cases because they know they'll win. And there are sometimes people who bring on cases just to have a good fight, a good show. And that's what the Philippines, um, in many ways, did. Whether the question of Chinese would suddenly withdraw because of this tribunal decision, the answer is probably no. But it's to flex their muscles and, and to show what international law can do. And that is exactly what and how I sort of suspected um, the purpose of the case was. Now, moving on to features, I just want to show you some pictures. And these are the um, diagrams that are actually in the judgment themselves. So, a before and after. Now, this is going to be a very interesting exercise, and this is exactly what the tribunal did. And if anything, the tribunal clarified something quite important for international law. The difference between a rock and an island. Now, you might ask, why is this important? As a state, if you are an island, you have certain entitlements and rights, particularly in relation to land, up to 200 nautical miles under law of the sea, airspace above it, and, of course, the sea below it. If you're a rock, nothing. No entitlements whatsoever. So here, you obviously um, have states interested in arguing. And for the judge, they need to determine, well, how are we going to assess? What is a rock? So let's examine it. What is a rock? Well, we look at the characteristics of the coral, the mud, whether they can sustain human life or not, and economic life. Hypothetically speaking, if they can't, status quo. Nothing changes. It's a rock. However, if it's an island, we will see land, we will see high tide, and of course, accruing from that, rights, entitlements of exclusive economic zone. Now, the, the judgment actually goes into detail of definitions as well. So what does it mean to sustain? So if you just have to imagine yourself, can you live on this island um, for an unextended uh, period without interruption, can you inhabit it? Do people actually live on this land? Um, is there a community? Does it you know, belong to a region? Is it an, a country, a town, a dwelling? Human habitation. Um, this is actually really important. This very notion of people living there. And they use the term indigenous population. And finally, whether there's economic activity. So, quite simply, I'm summarising it here. There's a number of things. If you've got water, maybe you can survive on it. Food by vegetation, soil, agriculture, presence of fishermen, commercial operations. So, if you can tick all those boxes, then you're an island. Hooray. You've got EEZ entitlements, and you can pretty much argue your case. Now, what's quite interesting is, and that's not really flagged by the media, is in the judgment, when the Philippines tried to argue a number of um, islands, because there were many islands that were actually um, involved, um, the rock said, no, it's actually a rock. It's not, a, it's not an island. You don't actually get entire <coughs> rights. But I guess there's a million dollar question out there. Well, what about the installations and all the, um, the island building that's being, um, being built? And I want to say that that is the very thing that the judgment hasn't decided on. What the judgment cleverly has done is they've touched upon areas which the law allows them to discuss, which is features of the installations, but not the installation themselves. Just as much as the sea, but not the territory. So we are still left with the question, what about the installations? Um, so I found this interesting um, slide, and just an example of misreading by the media. If you look at it, Tribunal found China has violated Philippine sovereign rights, exclusive economic zone, entering Philippine shipping, petroleum exploration, artificial and failing to prevent Chinese fishermen is supposed to be Philippine fishermen. <laughs> so you can see the errors in that. But what's interesting is, notwithstanding China not being a party, some might argue that China actually complied with the judgment. 
the very moment the judgment came out, they allowed Philippine fishermen to come in. And I think contrary to what um, some people may have expected, relationship on the face of it between the Philippines and China seemed to improve just by pure negotiation. So it's, it's, um, the question is still out there as to what impact this kind of judgment has had. So some of the findings that came out, and one of them I felt that when I was reading the judgment, about a third of it was in relation to the environment. And I actually think the winner of this tribunal hearing is not actually the Philippines, but the environment themselves. Many protection of the environment, uh, in endangered species, and of course, UNCLOS, uh, corrades in terms of collision at sea. And why do I say that? Because one of the points that um, the councils for the Philippines argued is that the Chinese failed to undertake impact assessments when building the installations. Now, can I just say, how many states do impact assessments? In fact, how many companies go out to the high seas and do impact assessments? Unless their own states have actually enacted international law, ratified whatever convention is out there, MARPOL and whatnot, I doubt, I very much doubt, um, they would have uh, had that law in the national legislation. So in other words, the councils were very intelligent in fighting a winning point. Of course the Chinese would fail under environmental protection. I'm sure many states would. And on one point in terms of other state participants, what is interesting is there are many vested, interested states in this particular case, but yet many have not been involved or are unable to. So to give an example, I was mentioning the difference between an ICJ, International Court of Justice case, and a PCA case, is ICJ is a bit like putting your laundry out there. Everyone can come and see it, everyone can hear in. And arbitration is supposed to be a more private matter. Only relevant parties are allowed to sit in. So when the US applied to become an observer, the tribunal made it very clear that the US has no interest whatsoever in this case, partly because geographically it's nowhere near Southeast Asia, and secondly, they have not even ratified UNCLOS. So what is, um, what is the conclusion? Well, I would say that there are many interesting aspects to this case, and as I said before, yet to be found out. What are the involvement of other, tri uh, other third parties? I think Taiwan tried to submit some evidence. The Phil uh, Vietnamese uh, tried to submit some evidence. Um, what kind of political, economic, and diplomatic implications? And I would argue that the law plays a role, but it also has its limitation. And I think this is where it ties back to the notion of bilateral and multilateral talks, um, which I'm sure most of you have more um, expertise in, in this. That law as a tool um, may not necessarily resolve all disputes, and that it, in, at the end of the day, comes down to parties negotiating and speaking to each other. And here I would use examples of past cases. For example, um, and this is territorial, between Israel and between, uh, I think it's Egypt, they used arbitration to resolve territorial disputes. You have the Iran and US Claims Tribunal. They themselves use that as a method to resolve disputes between parties. So what is the solution, and whether this is the beginning or the end? I have a very radical idea to suggest to the Chinese government and to all the other states. Why not turn this island building into um, a theme park to the benefit of all the Southeast Asians? And, and in that sense, there is a multilateral stake in there. And for the purpose, fun and enjoyment. And of course, it's a very radical idea. I don't know how they're going to take it. Um, but all in all, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I told, before coming here, I told the panelists that uh, the audience in Stockholm is always very inquisitive and they ask a lot of questions. And I'm sure that this will be the case today. So I open up for um, comments or for questions. We'll see how we do it practically with, uh, we have some, some microphones. And, and if you like, uh, I would ask you to, um, before you're asking you the question, to present yourself uh, and give your name. If you don't want to do it, uh, we live in a free country, so I cannot force you. <laughs> but uh, if you like, you can. So, um, should I use that one? Okay. All right, so do we have any, uh, any comments or questions? Yes, please. <coughs> Uh, my 
my name is Sam Su Lee. Uh, I'm working at ISDP. Uh, I have a question to Professor Hideya Kata. Uh, <laughs> thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation and it's very useful to understand the, the tense view on the situation in Korea. Uh, my question is uh, uh, the tension on Korea is extremely now rising. And then the Trump government is now considering many, many options, including uh, military measure, such as uh, preemptive strike. But uh, I was wondering uh, if it happens, uh, in reality, it's, it's still very difficult. But what uh, Japan's position on this option and uh, how Japan could play out? If Trump's back, we take a new direction. Yes, please. Thank you. I received a very challenging question. Um, I know nothing about it, what the Trump administration is going to be like. That is said that the all other option on the Preemption major, effective major strike would be one of them. But I, I really think that the uh, preemptive major strike would not solve the situation, security situation of this region. That will end the North Korean regime, that it will have a very fast repercussion, including Japan and South Korea too. So if the current administration embark on the preemptive strike from the first time, Japan's government will resist it, resist. <coughs> As you see in the Bush administration and in, in, in 2001 or 2002, in the Bush administration, they uh, claimed that the uh, a preemptive strike, as, as the president said, said so. At the time, then, yeah, in verbal commitment, the Japanese government supports a very hawkish approach of the, the Bush administration. But in reality, if that the Bush administration strike North Korea, the repercussion will be probably by the current of Japan. So in reality, if that the North, uh, United States uh, divert attention into the military uh, sphere, then Japan will resist that appeal for the reprimative efforts should be taken, undertaken in the weapons. So the, um, this is my personal opinion, not to use that definitely, that I have no idea what is the uh, best way to resolve North Korea's security challenge. As I said uh, in the pre a previous discussion with you, Japan did, and the international community really, including Japan, did everything to North Korea. Uh, to uh, make the plan a nuclear mission. And we presented, we, we, we uh, provided the full assistance, and uh, we uh, 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 showed the readiness to the economic assistance, and uh, we provided the chance to the uh, normal missions, and we provided the chance to, I can say, the existing agreement uh, uh, to be faced with a peace agreement with everything. With everything that is part of them, that North Korea is to be the North Korea and the nuclear and missile development. But I have no idea what is the additional measure to be taken in diplomacy in the bilateral relationship between the USA and North Korea. That's not the answer for your question. But I, I stress, I'd like to stress that the uh, military first strike from the United States would not be the solution. That's the part of the stress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay, my name is Marie Soderberg. I work at the European Institute of Japanese Studies. I actually have two questions, one to Mr. Professor Kurata and one to Ms. Tom. Uh, the one uh, in your presentation, it seems like US bases in Japan are in danger. 
But isn't the danger really to Japan itself? I mean, there are lots of uh, anti-Japanese feelings in North Korea since the war. So it's not only US basis, but it's a problem for Japan. And in the past, at least in history, historic times, many times we were, who oh, will you attack? Answer has been Japan, not the US. So I would like you to comment on that one. And uh, I was also wondering, what is the solution? What is the solution? Maybe the, the Pyongyang Declaration in 2002 would have helped solve the problem, and I would like you to comment on that one. As for the Philippine case, uh, was it true that China actually beat it by the arbitration court? Or wasn't it that uh, the area was opened up for uh, Philippine fishermen again after uh, <coughs> President Duterte went to China on his tour? and then agreed with Xi Jinping that vicious humans were allowed to go back into the area. And if that is the case, it's a very different matter, I think, because then we circumvent international law, <coughs> which could be a very, very dangerous thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Greta? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, my presentation referred to the um, North Korea's nuclear posture. And as said in the presentation, that, that in my understanding, North Korea's uh, missile, uh, nuclear missile that capability is to have a dual meeting, dual meaning. One is to attack the cities or industries of the adversary and counter bio capability. And second, a counter force capability to attack the nuclear basis of the adversary. To wait a nuclear war. They have their nuclear uh, uh, capability mm -hmm. have two set dual uh, capability. <coughs> one is a counter value, one is counter uh, counter forces. North Korea if the war break on the Korean Peninsula, and they will conduct a situation attack to the US mainland, possibly, and to Japan, including so that even if the North Korea's missile target the US bases, it will have the best, I can say, damage in the Japanese population. In the vicinity of the uh, Korean Peninsula, it's very true, very hard to how can they define the damage of a US space and damage of the Japanese population. So that in case that North Korea attack Japan, it will have the best damage in the Japanese population. That's what I want to say. And secondly, that I just said that the 2002 the Pyongyang Declaration between two countries is very important. Actually, this is the uh, almost only the document that the uh, late uh, Kim Jong Un signed. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult for the Korean North Korean people to deny the significance of that document. So that document is still valid. Mm -hmm. But I remind you that in that document, North Korea agreed to. Uh, solve the uh, Japan and North Korean relations comprehensively to include the missile, not uh, nuclear and missiles and others in a comprehensive manner. But at this time, North Korea have not shown that willingness to deal with no, uh, nuclear and missile problem with Japan. They insist that that kind of issue should be on the agenda in the talks with the United States. That is something that they stick to. So it's very, even if the judgment is valid, it is not a high time to deal with that issue with the, uh, the, uh, that priority with North Korea and Japan. It's very difficult to implement that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I guess I would clarify that yes, you're, you're right. And um, I think one thing about this decision, and I, and I guess for many it was a surprise, um, in terms of how, for example, the relationship between Philip on, on the face of it, and I say on the face of it in terms of what the media has presented um, and discussions, and when I mean um, complying with the judgment, I mean clearly the judgment says what it says, but in terms of allowing fishermen back in, um, that is an action you could say that was, when I say comply, as in by default, 
China doesn't recognize the judgment. I mean, that's, the, my, that's my understanding unless anything else comes out of it. Um, and I guess that triggers a bigger question, which is um, what happens in these circumstances in any parts of the high seas where installations are being built? What is the law? And currently the answer is um, there isn't anything, as from what I understand, from UNCLOS, for instance. And I would say it's not limited to such an activity. I'll give you an example. Um, offshore personnel. Um, as you may know, there are a lot of countries that have a lot of activities, for example, Scotland, um, offshore drilling. Um, there is an issue in terms of defining one offshore personnel because with that you have rights and entitlements if you're a crew, etc., etc. So there are many areas under international law and remi reminding ourselves that this document um, was drafted under three meetings, three conferences, where the third conference was when they actually involved Asian states, Asian countries, um, before UNCLOS was built. And I remember, as a student of international law, I complained to my law professor um, of the incompleteness of UNCLOS, and he would say to me, Helen, it's taken a long while to get here. And, and, I, and that's how I feel about international law, is that it's constantly developing. And when I say, um, the, the findings of this judgment are yet to be seen. In other words, the law in this area is probably going to develop because of this decision. And that's what tends to, tends to happen with case law. You know, what if there's another case? What if something else arises? Um, you know, the issue of whether this case would give rise to a conflict, again, is, is, a, is a question beyond me. But it, it gives rise to very interesting questions because of the avenues and opportunities and what action states take. Because if we you know, recall, this is a case between two parties only, despite the fact, of course, it has many ramifications in the regions. But then we might ask the question, well, what if it was done differently? Um, what if other states got involved? For example, Indonesia makes clear that they have no state in this, um, but geographically, we can tell, whilst, for example, the US, and for their interests, which is freedom of navigation. So um, I have met a, a um, US representative on this point, and they hone in on freedom of navigation, and they exercise it. But as far as I'm concerned, the Chinese government haven't actually stopped them at all. I think there might be YouTube videos which you can watch and see this whole you know, acculturation between the US saying they're coming and the China saying, please don't come, and back and forth. But actually, the US have been able to navigate with no problems. Um, and it's just quite interesting, again, how that, how that all plays out. And I think that's where I, I say there's a limit to the law, as in, this is the judgment. How do we enforce it? Um, if I use purely commercial cases, for instance, um, you can have here, and, and I use the word gain, which I know is a bit unfortunate. You, you, you go first round, you win, you appeal, you win the second round, you appeal again, the other side wins, and it's back and forth like this. In international tribunal, you, the highest level is at the Hague, that's it. In terms of enforcement, I guess you can have a scenario potentially where China brings in this judgment, goes to a local third party jurisdiction like France and say, I have an issue with evidence, whether the French can make a judgment on the use of evidence under their laws. You know, it's, there's very interesting aspects in how law can evolve. And my only connection to that is just saying how interesting observing, even though China doesn't admit to jurisdiction, they have somehow <coughs> indirectly complied with it. And again, um, that begs the question of, well, what purpose does this judgment serve then um, without the recognition aspect? Yeah, I don't know if that answers it. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, well, my name is. Yes, uh, my name is Richard Xi, and uh, I'm former UN official. Uh, I have a question to uh, Professor Kuhata. Mm -hmm. First, I would like to thank you very much for uh, the assessment that you made of North Korea and uh, your other comments. I, I find it very useful uh, the, the, uh, the, the way you see that the situation uh, and, and so on. Um, I also uh, want to say that uh, when you said that Japan has uh, really made uh, uh, many, many efforts uh, to ease the tension with North Korea, no, I, I, I fully agree that uh, what you have done is re remarkable. Uh, when I was reading to, 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 to your notes and listen to you, uh, it seems to me that uh, you, 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 you state indirectly that the uh, patient of Japan has reached a certain limit. Mm -hmm. And my question is the following, that the, uh, 
uh, I'm not a military expert, but I, I really want to, I would understand that North Korea uh, is doing all this effort to say that don't attack us. But that thing I understand. But I have a problem to understand that. What is the point for North Korea to say that I will attack you? And uh, you back? not you personally, <laughs> but, but for instance, I will attack the US. US is many, many times bigger. Whatever they can do against the bases in Japan, the US bases, the, the remaining force, we, we destroy them fully. Korea, uh, South Korea can also defend itself. And we don't know exactly what is the position of China. And uh, as you say, that Japan is now having a new military capabilities. So the chance that they will win is zero. So, 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 so is, is there really a attack? Uh, is the attack from North Korea really a real attack or, or just a way to pressurize the surrounding? Your question, thank you, thank you for your question. Your question is the uh, situation for North Korea to conduct the free anti nuclear attack to as well as South Korea and the United States, right? Yeah. Are they attacking or are they defending that first? Mm. Basically, the, the, I understand the North Korean nuclear posture is a new tolerance. They have no intention to waste the war against the United States. But in case, I, but it's even just such case, if the uh, <coughs> conventional, very limited local <coughs> conflict occur within the Korean Peninsula, <coughs> the limited conventional clash escalated in the whole, all, all out the, all, 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 all out war on the Korean Peninsula, even in the conventional. As I said in the presentation, to assist the South Korea, Japan's bases are used, and even the Guam and other bases should be used to assist the South Korea. In case that the local tension, local war will be enlarged and to involve Japan and Guam. And even in the case that the uh, US the, uh, combat actually in the conventional way, attack the Pyongyang, who are the major city in North Korea. It was very, it's very hard to imagine that North Korea regime can survive, even in the conventional term. In that situation, North Korea is destined to die. This is to kill by the US forces. In that case, it's also very hard to imagine that they will not use the nuclear weapon to Japan or South Korea, even the United States. So I understand their nuclear posture is basically this, uh, the, uh, the minimum deterrence to keep the second strategy for the first uh, posture. But in case that the conventional attack are mobilized to North Korea's attack, and uh, the attack to North Korea's regime, North Korea will decide that in case that they are destined to die, they will use nuclear fire strike to Japan or South Korea and even to the United States. So that I, mean, and then I, I would stress that their nuclear posture has a dual meaning. First is the minimum terms. But second, in case that they are attacked, that, that, such, that they are they receive the saturation attack from the United States, then that's the time to, for them to use the new weapon first. Thank you. Yes, we have a question over there. Thank you, and thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm uh, at the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and uh, I'm, uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, Mr. Stone, it would be interesting to listen a little bit about the East China Sea and maybe the possibilities of uh, having yet another ruling that uh, 
concentration or at the, at the court in the Hague regarding this issue, which is also quite contested and interesting. I'm not least touching upon the pan estimation. Uh, and secondly, I'll put a question to either or both of the gentlemen. Uh, it's regarding uh, FAD. I know it's a bilateral issue mainly between uh, South Korea and the US, but this anti-missile shield would be interesting to hear your assessment of what this, what kind of effect this has on the region's security and not least Japan's security. Yeah. So maybe you can dwell a little bit on this. It's rather a technical issue, but it's also very highly sensitive and security, and it's uh, actually quite interesting to hear a little bit from your take on this. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to start? Yeah, Helen, please start. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, well, it can be any problem, any dispute between two states, and they can bring it to tribunal. Absolutely. There is nothing stopping um, parties to go to court. Um, we've seen, for example, the whaling case between Australia and Japan. Um, we've seen the outcome of that. Um, of course, as I said before, it needs two consenting parties if it were to go to the court or the arbitration, strictly speaking. And... Um, matters can be disputed out. There's no, there's no doubt about it. No. And of course, as I said before, um, it's a tool for the states. So um, they have so many other options which they choose and they may or may not. What's interesting about the South China Sea, if I may, just bring it back and in reflection of potentiality <coughs> anywhere in the world, not just the East, um, um, North East Sea, but for example, when there's disputes between two countries and one doesn't submit to jurisdiction, there really isn't a case to run. I mean, it's very difficult. Um, in civil court, if you run a case against someone else, there's something called default judgment, which means you can win your case just like that. But I think in international law, it's not quite so straightforward. Um, there's other factors to be played out, political, economical, um, you know, for economic reasons, it might be better to be relations and not run a trial. Um, I think one of the things that people do undermine is the impact of running a case. Um, most of my clients would come to me, they think it'll be quick and easy over in a year, and they would think that it would resolve all their problems and it's business unusual. It usually ends in a total breakdown of a relationship. I don't know how well that would go in terms of between states um, and, and you know, what further ramifications that may have. And it's a total, it's, as I said, it's a toolbox. Um, it doesn't, it may resolve on the face of it, but it may not really truly create an understanding of what parties want. And hence, if we go back to our topic, you know, bilateralism, multilateralism, negotiation. I'm a fond believer of um, negotiation and making peace um, as a solution. So, you know, um, they may start a tribunal case and they might resolve it before it even gets anywhere. And that happens with a majority of court cases that I've seen in, in commercial litigation. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Kurata, would you like to comment on the question? Uh, thank you, thank you for the question. Our third missile system is the best system. As you said, the study is going to be deployed uh, uh, in a couple of months by the US and South Korean government agreement. The third missile coupled with the expand radio system will be deployed in the southern areas of South Korea to um, detect and to deter and to counterattack the uh, North Korean counter missile to, North, to South Korea. It is basically the, the bilateral agreement between the US and South Korea. At the agreement, our government, German government, said that it is welcome. From now on, this is a very personal thing. Also, this is basically the bilateral agreement that took up, but it has implications to Japan defense. It is not uh, concerned with the uh, uh, anti basic missile itself. It's a matter of the uh, expanded radar coupled with the missile system. Okay. The expanded radar is now located and deployed in Japan, and, and the local uh, people of the, the Honshu, our model prefecture, and the uh, Kyoto prefecture. We have second. Our two to the expanded system. That is a cover. That is to cover and detect the North Korean communist missile 
at Chinese companies. If the, the system, real system is located at the Bowie in South Korea, it is very helpful for, for Japan to detect earlier to the North Korean companies. I mean that, I remind you that Earth is round. Earth is round, so the uh, horizon will be lower. To detect the North Korea's uh, fire missile, it's very easy to attack the same location in South Korea. If the North Korea's missile is fired toward Japan, South Korea's located expanded can detect it earlier than Japan uh, expanded in Japan. So the South Korea's expanded data will be transferred to Hawaii, the C2BMC of the fire uh, Hika base. That is uh, transferred to the, the, uh, the uh, to Japan. So the expand red expand red system in South Korea is conducive as helpful and conducive for Japan safety. So I, in that sense, well welcome the South Missile should be deployed on the South. That is answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we have a question here. Wait, in the front here. Uh, no, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll let you. Do it. That, well, have you, you have the question answered. Hi, um, I'm Jai from Cypria. A question for Helen. Um, so you talked about military or these installations not being part of the international legal framework. So I had a question about another gap, which uh, to my understanding, um, islands that have been subsumed by water, uh, for instance, with sea level rise in the long term, mm -hmm. um, that's also not covered by either UNCLOS or, or other um, Frameworks. Is that the case? And um, what are the implications, you know, over the decades by the end of the century, if many of these low-lying islands are subsumed? Would you like to answer that? <coughs> <coughs> so I um, go back to one of my slides where I mentioned about the difference between an island and a rock, and. Um, for the most part, you know, in life and decision making, which is relevant to your question, is what is decided is at the present moment. So your question is, from what I get from it, is a hypothetical if in the future there is a decline and what, what are the consequences of that? Um, that is a very good question. But it also goes, it also ties in with this question of um, laws that are made before or after the event. So what I'm trying to say is, your, to answer your question, one can only assess, for example, whatever the scenario, the rock or the island, or whatever you want to be assessed, now, at this present moment, 2017. Come 2020 or 2050, you know, the laws may have already changed, in which case there might be clarity in terms of what the law is, and also, you know, this, the geographic scenario may, may differ. And what's interesting is, throughout this judgment, I mentioned before, is the importance of the environment environmental damage. I mentioned, I emphasized about the notion of impact assessments. So, you know, um, if you go to the EU or the UN, like sustainable development goals, this notion of the environment being so important and with climate change, I'm, I'm sure that would actually give rise to a lot of future discussions. You know, how countries can, you know, protect the sea line and, you know, environmental measures. I, re I remember having a geography lesson and this is all hypothetical. My, my geography teacher said something like, in the future, there'll be no Indonesia. With the idea that because of the rising um, five, I think, centimetre of water rising, you know, that, that somehow geographically, you know, there'll be disappearances of islands. I mean, that might be in you know, a few centuries' time. I have no idea. But, but you raise a relevant point, and I think that's um, something that's worth um, dis exploring as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, question in the front here. <coughs> About this uh, Korean Peninsula, um, I think China said uh, many times, uh, the foreign affairs uh, spokesperson said uh, uh, China just called for the uh, peace. They don't want to have any nuclear uh, proliferation in this uh, Korean Peninsula and uh, don't want to have this escalation of anger or irritation so third, insulation is really uh, maybe doing to the opposite. 
However, China, I noticed that they keep on saying this and not much more. Just say, we don't want to have a nuclear proliferation in the uh, uh, Korean Peninsula. And we like to see all parties come back to the table to talk. Um, and there, China really wishes to have a multilateral talk. Namely, my understanding is to resume either six-party or, or multi-party talk. So, my, finally, my question is, what is your comments about China's stance? Did you get that question? Uh, do you want to comment, Dr. <coughs> Professor Grata or Helen Dong or, or Professor Kubota? We, uh, you don't have to comment on, on judicial policy 2,200 years ago, but <laughs> since I haven't uh, answered that, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 Maybe so one, one more sentence I'd like to say. Everybody should remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I yeah, present, make a presentation that Japan is a very active contributor to the non-proliferation non and nuclear disarmament. So really, Japanese people are very enthusiastic about, uh, uh, say, the uh, denuclearization of the ball. So, so they're an active uh, contributor, I believe. And uh, yes, in some cases, yeah, Japan is very lucky or very happy uh, yeah, not joining in the military operation for the world uh, under the certain conditions, in, uh, not only limited to, not only at the, uh, the Cold War, but also after the Cold War. But the problem is that uh, uh, yeah, they said after the Cold War, when the international society jointly or have a consensus uh, to how to say to punish or to to some action toward the illegal action like the, which the, the, uh, uh, the Sad uh, uh, government of Saddam Hussein uh, did on uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it was a certain consensus among the, the international society that uh, they, you know, we should uh, do uh, 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 the joint operation to our, uh, the Iran. Uh, but uh, as I made a presentation uh, in my presentation, Japan could, could not do uh, to join uh, uh, actively under the certain invasion. So uh, in certain situation and. Uh, the, International society, uh, uh, Japan or other countries, uh, require uh, sometimes require us to join in order to maintain international order or uh, international uh, uh, justice you know, uh, pass through the legitimacy. Uh, so yeah, what, okay, uh, what, what I should add is that the nature of the conflict in present world is a little bit complicated. So in some case, of course, it's not the every time, but in some case, the military force has some certain role in order to, for example, protect the local population or in order to uh, uh, make uh, order uh, in, uh, for example, the democratic way or peaceful way. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just to answer to your question. So the, I completely agree with your view that the uh, Korean Peninsula is a you know, weapon uh, should not be the preferred of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we have a lot of powers. But at the same time, that the uh, six party talks with the viable framework for the resolve the nuclear weapon problems of the Korean Peninsula. I agree with the both of your view. But at the same time, I'd like to stress that the um, time to talk about North Korea's nuclear problem from the perspective of the non proliferation is over. North Korea possess nuclear weapon. That's not the nuclear weapon is proliferated in the Korean Peninsula. That's not the time to talk about that issue from the non proliferation issue. They possess nuclear weapons. Of course, I don't admit they're not there in the nuclear weapon state, but they actually have nuclear weapons. So that's why I, my presentation deal with nuclear posture. That six parties, I appreciate the Chinese role of the six party talks, but what the six party talks are for is for the no proliferation of the nuclear, uh, the nuclear weapons of the Korean Peninsula. The premise of the six party talks 
is almost broken. So it is very hard to imagine that the six pythons will be resumed in the foreseeable future. What are the six pythons? I see that the high possibility that bilateral relations between two countries, I mean, the US and Korea. That's what I said. The, I forgot to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, to answer the uh, some some the, uh, the, uh, the, pre uh, the question uh, uh, the, the previous question. I don't know what the Trump administration should Korea policy would be like, but I'm sure that the Trump's administration to Korea policy is quite different from the Obama's one. Obama's one is doubles as strategic patience to not to take the major action. To uh, rather than uh, take the middle action, the, open, the solutions of the Korean program, Korean nuclear program, would be outsourced to China. China may to make the greater role to resolve the problem. That the concept, a concept of the search for patience in the Obama administration. In contrast to the Obama administration, I think that the Trump administration's Korea policy would be not as Strategic impatience. <laughs> it is very hard to the Trump administration can stand the, uh, I can say, the longer time to resolve that new <coughs> problems. It's very hard to imagine that the uh, Trump administration to, I can say, to engage in the much of the talks uh, that is expired those for a long time, several years. The time frame of the uh, of, uh, Trump administration to look for the uh, developing program is very short. It's not impatience. I call it impatience. <laughs> they prefer some deal in a very short time. That's what I will say. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Can I have a follow up question? A short one? A short comment, please. Yeah, uh, when, when you mentioned the uh, uh, Iraq situation, uh, I think it's very different uh, in the Middle East, uh, between the Middle East and, uh, and uh, Korea, uh, Korean Peninsula and Japan. Uh, in the Middle East, you have vast land, and you can put a lot of missiles, you can bomb long time, still you have a place to fall. But uh, in North Korea, and Japan is not very big. So, I don't know, suppose Trump doesn't have any patience, so should we die together immediately? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, do I have any more questions? If not, may I ask a question? Um, the US-Japan alliance, the, the US government has said that uh, they recognize that the, the Japan administers uh, or has the control of the uh, Senkaku Island and that they will come to the defense if something happens. But when it comes to the South China Sea and protecting the sea lanes and the, the vital uh, transport also for, uh, for Japan, does, is there anything in international law that makes it more difficult for the US to help protect uh, Japanese vessels, for instance, or is it possible also for, at this moment, for Japanese, for the Japanese Navy to protect uh, commercial vessels in the South China Sea? I can't answer the, uh, the uh, international legal aspect, but uh, maybe it's related to the legislation of peace and security law in the uh, latter question. So, how or whether Japan can uh, support the uh, US, uh, US activity in, uh, when something happened in South China Sea? Yeah, yeah so the, yeah, there are uh, several, uh, how to say, it, several types of uh, uh, situation when where the Japan now can be able to do uh, as a, uh, using the uh, safety force and uh, the new legislation of peace and security say that uh, for example in the in the most situation uh, the 
the closest situation of the war, the Japan now uh, have have an uh, have an uh, how to say a, a can the respond to the armed attack. Uh, Attack against the foreign country uh, uh, resulted in it. In it. So, the, the attack, well, if the attack threatened the uh, uh, survival of Japan, so if that situation uh, adapt, uh, is adapt, uh, applicable, maybe, uh, and of course, it, it, it has some, a lot of uh, uh, condition to be met before, but uh, the, in the legal framework, certain. Uh, uh, can be done, but it's has an extreme case, I think, and uh, maybe the more uh, how to say a, a thinkable case is that uh, the sort of sim, uh, ship, inspect, ins, ship inspection inspection operation, uh, so which is uh, also enabled by the uh, uh, the current legislation of peace and security, which is a, a kind of uh, the expansion of the interpretation of the inspection operation, which is not uh, used to. Uh, be, uh, not be able to do that. Uh, now, it by uh, under the, uh, the consent of the uh, the, uh, the ship, uh, uh, Japanese uh, maritime ship is possible uh, can do some ship inspection operation. Uh, uh, that thing is what I can say mm -hmm. right now. But uh, the, I can say limited, but some can something can be done. Right Thank you. Helen, do you have a comment? Uh, thanks for the question, and uh, thanks, um, Professor Kubota, for the comments as well. Um, I think there are two things that are sort of running through my mind, and that is um, for navies to monitor the high seas, that's actually quite common, and when I think about particularly in relation to piracy in the high seas, the Gulf of Aden and Malacca Straits, um, states have actually joined forces to do that, to monitor security in the high seas. Um, and it goes hand in hand with international trade. So, for example, Malacca Straits, um, as you all may know, is a very busy, busy strait. It probably, um, there's an anticipation about 70% trade in Asia actually goes through there. So, in fact, it's uh, many countries' interest to ensure that there is safe passage. Um, one of the things that um, it's talked about is um, some innocent passage, even if you see a naval ship coming near one's um, borders, it's to ensure that, you know, it's for peaceful passage and, and for that purpose. Um, so I guess there probably will be a need for clarity, particularly in relation to what's happening in the South China Sea. Um, my, my initial instinct is, you know, if commercial ships can pass through there, no problems, no in interdiction or any problems, they're not going to be bothered. I think that's just how businesses are, as long as it doesn't come <laughs> within my territory, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be um, too worried. But obviously, if it stops or hinders international commercial trade, then I think that will raise greater questions. Um, so to give an example, um, about two years ago, um, the Japanese actually changed their legislation, um, which was quite historical, um, on allowing Japanese flagships to have armed guards with the purpose of safeguarding Japanese flagships. Um, and I say it's historical because were it to any other circumstance, it may not be something that's so um, lightly seen upon. But the reason it was successful was because the Japanese ship owners um, knew that piracy at high sea was a problem um, and they needed that protection to in order that they have safe passage. You know, it's, it's a commercial decision, basically. Um, so I think it applies probably equally the same in this China Sea and elsewhere. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions or comments? Yes, please. My name is Ian Sexton. I'm a member of the Defense Center at ICT. And uh, my question is more related to... I think you need to push some button there. OK. No. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay, my question is more related to domestic politics in Japan, which I realize is not your research focuses, but uh, I would just like to ask that given the high approval ratings for the current government, but also perhaps the sort of strong opposition toward revising Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, do you see a revision in the near future of Article 9, perhaps in, in others current term, the PM's current term? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> Do you 
you mean the, do you mean the possibility of the, the re, uh, re, uh, revising the article uh, 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 discourse? Exactly. Is it politically possible? Yeah, uh, maybe it's uh, hard to answer. I think, uh, uh, of course, the te uh, technically, the, if, the, uh, if there are uh, certain, uh, how to say that, uh, uh, incumbency gov government had, uh, 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 so for example, uh, LDP, gov uh, LDP has much, if the LDP has much, uh, uh, congressman in in, in the diet, uh, and also had uh, uh, two uh, 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 half of the population uh, uh, support the, uh, the uh, revision of the uh, uh, constitution. Constitution technically it, it, it can uh, be revised, but uh, uh, I'm not sure that what kind of uh, uh, what what is the uh, uh, the real possibility of that uh, situation also. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mm, I'd like to add the description of Mr. He said that the half of the Japanese population is for the religious amendment of the African man. But it, mm, on the other hand, means that yeah, half of the population support the African so the, it is very hard to imagine that to revise the uh, constitution, especially now, uh, I'm focusing on now uh, half the mind, to revise for the future, for, for, uh, for the foreseeable future. So almost the population, if it is the agenda is focused on half the mind, um, most of the Japanese population is against to revise it. Almost the Japanese population is by revise, uh, by, by the delete, uh, Deleting the article of the constitution, that will pave the way for Japan to be, I can say, entangled and trapped with the uh, other con uh, countries in the other so way, including current countries. But that's very narrow for the uh, countries of the outside world. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have to end. Today's seminar here, and I'd like to thank you for, for attending. And let me also say that this is a seminar that has been arranged by the newly instituted uh, Japan Center at the ISDP. And we would like to arrange many more uh, seminars of this kind in the future. Also, we have a small questionnaire uh, that I think you can grab when you leave. And if uh, I don't ask too much of you, could you please? fill out this questionnaire and give us some thoughts on, on the usefulness of this seminar today. But thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again at the seminar in the future. Thank you. And thank you very much for the panelists. We'll give them a warm hand. <laughs>